everyone, it's Katrina. Number 10. The Pine Cone The pine cone is one of the most mysterious symbols in human history. It's something that you can find in your backyard and just about anywhere on Earth that you might live. But it's not just a crispy little tree egg. It also has cultural and religious significance spanning thousands of years. Take a look at the Fontana de la Pigna, for example. It's an ancient Roman fountain currently decorating the Cortile de la Pigna in Vatican City. The fountain's centerpiece is a gigantic bronze pine cone almost 12 feet tall. Water once gushed from its top, but is currently dormant. Archaeologists believe the pine cone was moved from its original position at the Temple of Isis. It went from being a monument to a pagan god at the Egyptian temple to adorning the courtyard of old St. Peter's Basilica in the Middle Ages. Then, in 1608, it was moved a third time to its current location. The courtyard where the giant bronze pine cone sat is presently used to be part of a passage that connected the palace of Pope Innocent VIII with the Sistine Chapel. With the construction of the Vatican Library, the Cortile del Belvedere was divided and the upper part of the courtyard kept the fountain as decoration. The bronze peacocks beside the pine cone are copies of the peacocks found in the tomb of Emperor Hadrian. See, it's all coming together! The Temple of Isis was one of many holy sanctuaries dedicated to an Egyptian deity built in Rome. The Romans were fascinated with the old cults of ancient Egypt. Isis was a goddess of fertility, the mother goddess. She was synonymous with the pine cone, a symbol that represented fertility and eternal life to the Egyptians. But the Egyptians weren't the first ones to use it. The pine cone was a symbol of fertility going all the way back to the first major civilization of Sumer. Their gods, the Anunnaki, were depicted holding pine cones. The tradition is still alive and well today. The Pope's staff has a pine cone embedded in it. So, what is this human obsession with the pine cone? Nobody can say for sure what the hidden symbolism behind the pine cone is. Some suggest the pine cone is a representation of the pineal gland, or the third eye. Others say its design is a Fibonacci sequence. The sequence is seen in hurricanes, galaxies, sunflowers. It's a major thing. Whatever the case, Christians are still using the symbol of ancient pagan gods. Number 9. The Portuguese Stonehenge Stonehenge may be the most famous of all the megalithic structures of the ancient world, but it certainly isn't the oldest. There are megalithic sites in Portugal far more ancient than Stonehenge. For example, the Almendres Cromlech. It is a fantastic archaeological site home to 90 gigantic stones which wrap around to form two concentric rings. People call it the Stonehenge of Portugal. It was built around 5000 BC, making it roughly 2,000 years older than Stonehenge's initial construction. Many of the stones have been beaten down by the weather, horribly eroded, but even in their worn condition you can see how the stones are similar to the ones in England. They aren't as large or as impressive, but their purpose was likely the same. What purpose would that be? This is a difficult question to answer. Researchers assume Stonehenge was used as an astrological observatory, and it's the same case in Portugal. Many of the stones were moved around 3000 BC. Experts think that was because the alignment of the stars and other celestial objects changed over the centuries. The ancient people needed to reposition the stones so that they continue to track the movements of objects in the cosmos. Did the builders of Stonehenge and the builders of the Almendres Cromlech know each other? Were they connected by some ancient ancient belief in cosmic gods? Maybe they even taught one another how to track the stars and planets using stone circles. It's a massive mystery that archaeologists are currently unable to solve. There are stone circles all across Western Europe, so many that it's hard to imagine they weren't somehow linked. It's not as though people didn't know the other stone circles existed, but who copied who? And what was the point of it all? Do you have any theories? Let me know in the comments and be sure to subscribe while you're at it! Number 8. Who were the Shardana? In Egypt, there is an inscription from the 13th century BC made during the rule of King Ramses II. The inscription reads, The unruly Sheridan, whom no one had ever known how to combat, they came boldly sailing in their warships from the midst of the sea, none being able to withstand them. The inscription is referring to a group of mercenaries who came to Egypt from parts unknown and began working as swords for hire for the royal family. Correspondence found the ancient city of Amarna mentions the Shardana working for the prince of Byblos. 
For an estimated 200 years, starting with Ramses II, they were a powerful ally of Egyptian kings. There were even strongholds located throughout Egypt where only the Shardana mercenaries lived. But who were these people? When they first came to Egypt, they were not friendly. They participated in seaside raids until Ramses basically paid them to stop and work for him instead. They may have been involved in earlier raids in the 14th century BC during the rule of Amenhotep III, but historians aren't certain. They also may have been the same mysterious sea people who were raiding towns along the coast of Cyprus. The king of Alashia complained about an unnamed group terrorizing his towns year after year. Even the biblical Hittites complained about mysterious raiding parties. The evidence seems to point at the Shardana as being the scourge of the Mediterranean. So who were they? There are a few possibilities. Michael Wood, a famous English historian, suggested the Shardana raids were responsible for the collapse of the Mycenaean civilization in Greece. They may have been a rogue force of the group known as the Sea People, but there are way too many theories and nobody can agree. Some think they may have been from Troy. The strange horn helmets they wore bring to mind the Vikings, though the Shardana were 2,000 years too early to be Viking, and apparently Vikings never wore those those horned helmets in the first place. Number 7. The Mysterious Link The Coricancha, aka the Golden Temple, is an ancient religious building in the Incan city of Cusco in Peru. Researchers believe the temple was originally dedicated to the god Inti, and the steles were painted gold in reverence of the sun. Nobody is entirely sure when construction on the temple began. It likely started around 1438, with the rise of the Inca ruler Pachacutec, who famously remodeled much of the city. The Coricancha stood at the center of Cusco as the most important ritual temple. The garden was full of beautiful plants and wild animals. The floors and walls may have been coated in gold. The temple itself is similar to temples found in Machu Picchu and other Inca cities. They used a megalithic style of architecture in which they perfectly fit gigantic bricks to create flawless walls. Some archaeologists called it an imperial style, with the buildings really coming off as big and strong. How the Inca built such perfect walls is a subject of great debate. Modern engineers say the precision of the stonework is on par with today's advanced machining, but the Inca were hardly the only ones to use such an advanced building technique. 6,500 miles away in Egypt, the Valley Temple boasts a similar construction. The Valley Temple stands next to the Great Sphinx. Its architectural style is so similar to the Coricancha Temple that if you look only at pictures of the stonework, you can hardly tell them apart. Both temples were built of massive blocks fitted perfectly together. The blocks are so tight that you can't fit a sheet of paper between them. Many of the limestone blocks at the Valley Temple have been estimated to weigh 200 tons. That's very similar to the stones in Peru. How in the world these temples were built in the ancient past, especially the Egyptian temple being far older, is a massive mystery. They didn't even use mortar. Number 6. Adam's Calendar Adam's calendar in South Africa predates the pyramids of Egypt by a massive number of years. The stone circle has been estimated at 75,000 years old. That makes it more than 70,000 years older than the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's been called the oldest megalithic site in the world. Researchers have identified multiple astronomical alignments that would have only been possible with advanced knowledge of the cosmos. It could be the only example of a fully functioning megalithic stone calendar. But Adam's calendar may be one of many. There are thousands of stone circles spread throughout the mountains of South Africa. All of them are in ruins, but they are there if you go looking for them. Most of them have never been explained. The first stone circles were found in 1891 by English explorer Theodore Bent, who estimated there were about 4,000 in South Africa. By 1974, scientists agreed there were over 20,000. Michael Tellinger has pushed the number higher to an estimated 100,000. This obviously leads to a monumental question. Who built up to 100,000 primitive stone monuments in the prehistoric age prior to the end of the Ice Age. Was it people? Was there an incredibly intelligent race of humans or other beings living on the planet? Humans existed, but they weren't building stone circles. They were having a difficult enough time not being eaten by lions and packs of hyenas. Or were they? Scientists have been grasping at straws to make sense of Adam's calendar and the other megalithic sites in the area. African elders call the region the birthplace of the sun. 
mainstream archaeologists call these stone circles livestock enclosures, left over by the Bantu people in the 14th century. Yet Adam's calendar works as a perfect sundial. Shadows fall over the rocks as the sun moves across the sky, creating a perfect clock. What kind of animal pen doubles as a solar calendar? There are two more interesting aspects of the region. One is that there is a whole lot of gold in the ground here. The second is that these stones are up to five tons each. How these stones would have been moved is mind-boggling, but the fact that there is a lot of gold does make sense if you're a believer in the theory about the Anunnaki, specifically the idea that they came to Earth tens of thousands of years ago. The Anunnaki elder gods were supposedly the ones who used primitive humans to mine for gold. In the 19th century, when rich gold reefs attracted prospectors, a lot of the area was damaged by the creation of mining shafts. Much archaeological history may have been destroyed. It could be that 75,000 years ago, humans were used as slaves in the mines. These stone circles may have been where the first intelligent humans lived. Then, after the Anunnaki left, it took humans a long time to develop societies again. It's just a wild theory, but what do you think? Number 5. The Panoti what if there was a tribe of humans with ears as big as those of an African elephant? If you had asked Roman historian Pliny the Elder 2,000 years ago, he would have told you all about them. He wrote about a tribe of people he called the Panotti sometime between 77 and 79 AD. The strange features of these impossible people were detailed in his series Natural History. It's one of the best ancient texts on the natural history of the Roman world. Many things Pliny the Elder described were perfectly real real, but other things he wrote down don't make as much sense. Pliny said the Panotti lived on the All Ears Islands, located somewhere near Scythia. He wrote that they had humongous ears that were so big they hung all the way to their knees. It was like these people had parachutes attached to the sides of their heads. They were completely normal, except for their Dumbo ears. It would be easy to dismiss the Panotti tribe as a Roman fantasy if it weren't for the fact that they kept popping up over the next 1,400 years. In 1491, Henrik Martellus created a map of the world. On the map, he showed a strange group of giant-eared people living in southern Asia. Hartman Schiedel detailed the Panotti a few years later in a book about human history and the biblical creation of the world. He was a doctor, but seemed totally convinced that the Panotti were real. Were all these appearances coincidences? Or were there really humans with elephant-sized ears? Number 4. The Tree of Life there is a tree which sprouts from the barren wasteland of Bahrain's lifeless desert. There isn't a speck of vegetation for miles in any direction. Nothing green survives in this wilderness. Yet somehow, the tree rises majestically without a sip of water. Locals call it the Tree of Life. They think it marks the exact place where the Garden of Eden once stood. The tree is not that spectacular in and of itself. It's only about 30 feet tall and wouldn't look very interesting if it wasn't the only tree for miles around. In the middle of the Arabian desert, it's like an oasis of greenery. Its branches and roots are full of water, yet it has no access to a water source. If this tree truly stood in the Garden of Eden, it would have to be thousands of years old, right? scientists in the 1990s performed a soil analysis. They confirmed the tree was planted sometime around 1582. It's just shy of 500 years old. That means it definitely wasn't standing in the Garden of Eden. Still, religious locals contest the date. What does the Bible say about the great tree? In the biblical tale of the Garden of Eden, there is indeed a tree of life. It takes the form of a mighty acacia. There is a tree of life in just about every ancient mythology. The Vikings had the world tree. Even the ancient Babylonians in 4000 BC believed in a mystical tree protected by Enki, the Sumerian god of fresh water. Bahrain isn't even the only country where locals claim the Garden of Eden once stood. Similar claims have been made in Botswana, Jerusalem, Mexico, and the US. Each nation offers their own magical tree as the tree of life. Number 3. Somapura Mahavihara there is an extremely unusual place in Bangladesh that's been called both a temple and an alien landing pad. Its name is Somapura Mahavihara, and it is one of the earliest Buddhist monasteries attributed to the culture of Bengal. The temple has a central structure in the middle of a truly massive courtyard. The ground plan looks sort of like a cross, with a central superstructure rising roughly 70 feet off the ground. 
but the temple isn't complete. Archaeologists think pieces of the superstructure are missing, which has led to the mystery of what it was used for. Some suggest there was a massive spire attached to the top of the temple and potentially covered in jewels. Others believe Somapura Mahavihara was used as a landing pad for the legendary aircraft known as a Vimana in Hindu myth. Vimanas are mythical vehicles from Hindu and Sanskrit texts. They are described as flying palaces or hovering chariots. They were kind of like floating cities that moved easily around the world and beyond into space. Many depictions of the flying chariots make them look an awful lot like alien vessels. They almost look like motherships moving effortlessly above the world. Myth says the Vimanas were used by the gods. The gods lived in them and used them as their seat of power. There isn't any proof that Vimanas were real, but they sure were mentioned a lot in historical texts. The ancient people seemed to believe the gods were real physical beings in the world who had access to giant flying palaces. What if their gods were beings from another world? world, that would be one truly magical coincidence. The Somapura Mahavihara Monastery Complex has been standing since the 8th century AD. It was definitely used by Buddhist monks. There are nearly 200 rooms where the monks used to live inside the outer monastery walls. The storehouses remain, the kitchens, all the things you would expect to find in a monastery. But the design does leave a lot of open spaces where a large flying machine could theoretically land. What if the alleged spire at the top of the temple, missing for a thousand years, was a communications beacon? It sounds far-fetched, but is anything really impossible? What do you think? Tell me in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it. Number 2. Symbols of Peace The olive branch is a universal symbol of peace. It dates back to the 5th century BC. Ancient Greeks believed olive branches had the power to drive out evil spirits. The Greek goddess of peace, Irene, wielded an olive branch. Because the olive tree took years to bear fruit during the early years of cultivation, they were synonymous with peacetime. It was said that anyone who would plant an olive grove must have been expecting years of peace to come. During the first Olympic Games, winners were crowned with a wreath of olive branches. Many peaceful symbols originated in obscure places but managed to persist through the years. The olive branch continued to be a symbol of peace in the Middle Ages. There is a gold coin minted in 1644 that shows King Charles I with a sword and olive branch. Then there's the symbol of the dove, a representation of peace and innocence. What's really incredible is that the dove appeared in both Greek and Japanese mythologies. The Greeks saw it as a symbol of eternal love. In Japan, a dove carrying a sword was used to symbolize the ending of war. When Christians first started baptizing each other, baptisms were typically accompanied by a dove. When the flood was over and Noah finally landed his boat in the Bible, he released a dove to signal the tragedy had passed. Another ancient symbol of peace is the rainbow. The Greeks associated the rainbow with the goddess Iris, who was kind of like the postal service for the gods on Mount Olympus. Viking myth made the rainbow into a bridge, connecting the realm of men with the realm of gods. The rainbow was always seen as something that connected gods and humans. In Chinese tradition, the rainbow is a common representation of yin and yang, and is typical to see during weddings. Number 1. The Lost Stone Head of Guatemala about five decades ago, in the jungles of Guatemala, a man came across a gigantic stone head. It was a shocking thing to find tangled in jungle vines and hidden underneath the shadow of the canopy. The stone head was intriguing because it didn't appear to represent someone from Mayan society. The lips were very thin. The features were a little too fine to be Mayan. The nose was large and the eyes were turned to the sky. To many, the face looked like it had Caucasian features. It looked like the face of someone from prehistoric Russia or elsewhere in Europe. The discovery of this stone head didn't become a big deal for years. A photograph was sent to Dr. Oscar Rafael Padilla in 1987 with a description. The photograph was allegedly taken by the owner of the land where the head was found in the 1950s, 30 years earlier. The doctor tracked down the piece of property hoping to locate the monolith after all that time. 
Unfortunately, he found the stone head had been destroyed about 10 years before he got there. Guerrilla fighters had blown it up as target practice. The head was badly damaged but not totally gone. The doctor was able to measure it at about 18 feet tall, but the features were erased, making it impossible to do a real investigation. All that remains today is the photograph taken in the 1950s. It does seem to show a head modeled after a Caucasian man. Guatemalan archaeologist Hector E. Mejia wrote a few years ago that the monument presents no characteristics of any pre-Hispanic civilization. This leaves a lot of unanswered questions. Who made the head? Was a Caucasian man in Mesoamerica thousands of years ago? The monolith was probably carved by the Olmec civilization around 1400 BC, perhaps a little earlier, but that's only an educated guess. It looks nothing like the other Olmec stone heads found throughout Mexico. Maybe there was an unknown civilization from Europe who lived briefly in the Guatemalan jungle. Maybe it was only a small group who visited the Olmec and appeared to the indigenous people as someone else that needed to be represented in stone. What are your theories? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching! Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time! Bye!